If you shoot landscape or macro, this video is gonna be really practical for you. It's gonna show you how to get the sharpest pictures possible. You might also like it if you're interested in the science of photography. I'm gonna talk about diffraction, which will wreck image quality at high f-stop numbers. And I'm gonna talk about the mechanisms behind how it works. I'm gonna do the best I can with it, even though the physics behind this aren't totally understood even by scientists. If you love learning, you should check out Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in design, business, and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so you can join the classes and communities that are just right for you. Whether you wanna fuel your creativity, curiosity, or even career, Skillshare is the perfect place to keep you learning and thriving. I just watched a landscape photography tutorial about aerial photography by Michael Yamashita, and it was remarkable. I really haven't seen many good photographers teaching proper drone photography techniques, and I think it'll make a big difference in my photography. Skillshare is super affordable with annual subscriptions less than $10 a month. So join more than 7 million creators in the Skillshare community. The first 500 people to use the link in my description will get a two month free trial. Thanks for sponsoring this Skillshare. Let's get into it with some practical examples. You're probably familiar with the effect of using higher f-stop numbers in photography. High f-stop number, high background sharpness. We can see it in a sequence of photos like these. I will typically use a higher f-stop number when I want to show more context, when I want the background to be nice and sharp. In landscape work, often you want both the foreground and the distant background to be sharp, and that forces you to use a high f-stop number. So we think of higher f-stop numbers as adding more sharpness, but in reality, at the place where you're focusing, the opposite is really true. While you might get a little bit more sharpness one or two stops above your lens's base f-stop number, the lowest f-stop number, once you get above f8, f11, and into like F16 and F22, an effect called diffraction starts to ruin your sharpness. Let's look at a few side-by-side -side pictures and you can see no matter what the camera, there is a distinct difference here. So now you know high f-stop numbers give you lower sharpness, but what do you do about it? I mean, you could just avoid using high f-stop numbers. I do generally, unless I absolutely need to get things in the foreground and the distant background in focus but most of the time using a high f-stop number is still going to be the right thing to do, but don't go overly high. I know some people will just flip it over to F22 or F16 whenever they wanna to get tons of focus because they don't wanna worry about whether they have enough or not. In those situations, it's kind of hard to see the back of the screen and know whether something is sharp enough. I will usually just take a series of photos. I'll take photos at F56, F8, F11, F16, F22, because I can do that in a couple of seconds by just moving the main dial in aperture priority mode. And then back at my computer, I can compare them and pick the one that ends up being the sharpest. If you want the ultimate sharpness while overcoming diffraction, you can use focus stacking. Focus on the foreground, focus on the background, and maybe some points in between, and stack those images together. For detailed information, check out chapter nine and 10 in my book, Stunning Digital Photography, which covers landscape and macro photography and how you can overcome diffraction in those scenarios. Now let's talk about how diffraction actually works, the science behind it. Here's a really basic camera diagram. To simplify things, I've left out all the optics. I'm not gonna talk about how the image is flipped upside down. We're only talking about sharpness at the focal plane, not things that are before or behind the focal plane. So when you have a wide aperture like this, this is our aperture, this is our sensor, and this is the subject that we're taking a picture of in red there. Light travels through the middle here and strikes the sensor. Now, you have a lot of light coming through and it all follows a pretty straight path. Sorry, my hand isn't completely straight. Some light will be coming through and passing near the aperture. And if it comes close enough, the photon of light will actually be attracted to the aperture. This is something that physicists don't seem to have a perfect grasp on based on what I've read but it seems like the photon is interacting with the electrons of the atoms on this part of the aperture right here. And what happens is it causes it to curve a little bit. This is exaggerated. It's only going to move maybe a pixel or two, maybe three or four pixels. It tops on a really high resolution sensor. It's enough to reduce the sharpness of your pictures. Now, with a big aperture like this, you can see the vast majority of photons are not affected by the aperture. Let's move to a smaller aperture. If this was f2.8, this might be 
F22. Now here, I'm gonna to have to make this a little more complex. I'm gonna to have to deal with the image flipping. We can see things that are at the bottom of the image here will pass through the aperture and hit the top part of the sensor here. And things that are in the middle will just fly straight through. And then things over here will fly through here. But as you can see, as I'm drawing these lines, they're coming very close to the edges of the aperture here. So you know what happens already. As it comes close, it starts to actually bend a little bit. It's going to curve it around this. Because the opening of the iris here is so much smaller than it was before, a higher percentage of the photons are passing very close to the edges of that aperture, thus being veered off their normal path by the pull from the electrons at the edges of that aperture, of that iris. Here's the twist. If the pull from the edge of the aperture affected every photon exactly the same, we wouldn't see a reduction in sharpness. Every photon bouncing off the same point on the subject we're photographing would follow the exact same path. They would take the same curve around the aperture here and end up at exactly the same pixel. But the effect that we see is that photons bouncing off a single point in the subject we're photographing end up at different pixels. They end up scattered. We know that's what happens because we can measure the effects of it. What we don't know for sure is why exactly that's happening. At least I haven't found anybody who seems to know. Now, my own personal theory is that light does not travel in straight lines as I've illustrated here. Light is actually a wave. Now, the wavelengths here are very small. Even if you're at F22 on a full frame camera, the wavelength of light is probably 5,000 times smaller than the opening of the aperture. So I can't draw this to scale. <laughs> but what does happen is as light is traveling in a wave here, different photons will be at different points in the wave as they pass the aperture. And that means some photons from the same point in the origin will pass closer to the aperture and thus get veered off path more. That's because all the photons originating from a single point are not perfectly synchronized, but they're a little bit out of sync. They all pass at a slightly different distance to the aperture, thus bending different amounts and ending up at different parts of the sensor. This is not the explanation you'll hear from other people. You mostly get people who are showing examples of water. The physics of light are very different from those of water. You'll see people talking about double slit experiments and light interfering with itself, but that mostly happens when the size of the aperture is about the same size as the wavelength of light. And as I mentioned, the aperture, even when it's very small, is probably 5,000 times bigger than the wavelength of the light. So. I think it's simply a misunderstanding. I imagine what happens is people look up diffraction of light and they end up coming across physics articles that discuss proper light diffraction and they get that confused with the effect that's happening here, which is not the same as photons interfering with themselves. That can happen, but it's not what's happening here to the best of my research. Let's wrap this up with frequently asked questions. Here's a comment I saw. For what the damn camera companies are charging for their lenses and bodies, there should be no diffraction. It doesn't matter how expensive your lens is, it's not gonna overcome basic properties of physics. In fact, in our own tests, when we compare high quality glass with inexpensive glass, the high quality glass will blow the inexpensive glass away at low f-stop numbers, but that difference always disappears as you use higher and higher f-stop numbers. Why? Because diffraction is impacting those lenses equally. The high quality glass never looks worse than the low quality glass, but you probably won't ever see the difference if you're shooting at f22. And that can be kind of important to know. If you're a landscape photographer and you're always at f8 and above and you're never shooting wide open, then you can probably go with cheap glass and be just fine. I see some people who think that medium format is superior because the apertures on medium format lenses are physically larger than the apertures on say full frame or APS-C or micro four thirds lenses. And that is true for a given f-stop number. But if you use the rules of crop factor and you apply crop factor to that f-stop, you will get equivalent results. You'll get similar amounts of depth of field and similar amounts of diffraction. So for any given 
depth of field that you need. The diffraction levels will be the same whether you're shooting with a teeny tiny sensor or a big huge sensor. Some people say, hey, I heard that my lens actually gets sharper when I stop it down from f2.8 to f4 or f5.6 to f8. That can be true. That is an entirely different effect from diffraction. When you go from shooting wide open to a stop lower, you're using less of the glass and thus you're seeing fewer of the aberrations in the lens reflected in your final image. No lens is absolutely perfect and smaller f-stop numbers use less and less of the glass. They also use less and less of the outsides of the optics of the lens where most of the aberrations tend to be. So this is especially true in lower quality glass. Shutting the aperture down will generally improve the quality, but it's true on higher quality glass too. Lower quality glass, you might get best results by shooting two stops down, whereas with higher quality glass, sometimes it's one stop down or some glass is even sharpest wide open. So. Higher f-stop numbers decrease the effect of aberrations, thus improving your sharpness, but higher f-stop numbers also increase the effect of diffraction, which decreases your sharpness. Somewhere there's a balance between these two that provides you with the sweet spot where the effect of aberrations are minimized and the effect of diffraction is as low as possible. And the best way to find this is to just set up your camera and take a series of shots at every different f-stop and then zoom in and look really close and see which one is sharpest. It's just putting your camera on a tripod, setting the shutter for a delayed shutter and taking a picture at the base ISO. Hey, I said earlier that nobody seems to understand exactly why this is happening. But if you're an optical physicist and you happen to confidently know why the blurring effect happens at normal apertures, not pinhole apertures, but normal apertures, I'd love to hear from you. Write a comment down below and maybe send me an email too. And if you want more cool, nerdy, practical videos like this, camera reviews, tutorials, and our live show where we will review your photos and give you feedback every Thursday at five, subscribe to this channel. And thanks to our sponsor, Skillshare. Millions of creators just like you are using their educational videos to learn and improve their skills and just educate themselves. So be one of the first 500 people and try it out because I bet you'll like it. Thanks.